Hey there everyone, welcome to the short version of my top 10 games of 2014. Check the description box below for the extra long version that goes into a bit more depth on these choices, but for those of you who just want the quick list, keep on listening. So with that out of the way, this is a top 10 list of the games I played in 2014 in the order of the level of enjoyment I got out of them. And release dates are by the Japanese release dates, unless there isn't one, of course. So, let's get into it. Number 10 on my list is Lost Dimension, a game I was pretty interested in when it was announced. It's a strategy RPG with a character elimination mystery element. It's also developed by Lankars, who worked on Shin Megami Tensei Strange Journey and the Etrian Odyssey series. So, I was pretty interested. But the end product turned out to be a rather fun experience. You have an active turn-based strategy system similar to Valkyria Chronicles, character interactions and a judgment system between stages, and an interesting mystery to solve in the overall story. This Vita game didn't do all that well in sales though, so a release outside of Japan is seemingly unlikely, but in the off chance that it is released, I'd definitely recommend it. Number 9 is the sexiest horror game you'll ever play. It's also paradoxically on the Wii U, so this is Fatal Frame 5, developed by Tecmo Koei. Uh, the latest entry in the Fatal Frame series, it takes things in a decidedly sexy direction by making nearly every character in the game, including the ghosts, terribly attractive. Combine that with a wetness mechanic which has the character's clothing getting progressively wetter throughout the story, and you have this kind of odd juxtaposition of a wet t-shirt contest and a Japanese horror movie. But upon saying that, it doesn't sound like it's going to be a good game, but it does manage to pull off a creepy environment and dole out a few scares regardless of the sexy elements, and the gameplay utilizes the Wii U gamepad quite well. well also not changing up the Fatal Frame formula too much. It even has uh, bonus missions with Ayane from Dead or Alive after the main story is completed. So it's a fun and definitely worth a look, so check it out if you get a chance. Number 8 on my list is a sequel to one of the most underrated and unknown RPGs from the PS1 era, Ore no Shigabane o Koete Yuke. The sequel, aptly named Ore no Shikabane o Koete Yo 2, or Ore Shika 2, takes the first game, updates the system a bit, changes a few things, and keeps a few things the same. Uh, the art style is rather striking in that everything looks like it belongs in either a woodcut print or in a kabuki play. The cell shading, coupled with the woodcut filter, make the game look great and kind of gives off a feeling of interacting with the floating world of Ukiyo-e. This game, while being an RPG, takes the general progression method of a standard RPG and throws it away, and in its place gives you this family generation system whereupon generation after generation of character gains better stats and therefore more strength and speed and abilities and allowing for further progression in the game. Another good thing about this game is that it was released outside of Japan as well, so even you non-Japanese speakers can take part in the game. Uh, well, it's not as good as the original game, it does manage to be fun and interesting all the way through, and I would definitely recommend it. Number 7 is a game that's totally out of character for me. It's a visual novel, an erotic visual novel, Actually, it's the first erotic visual novel I've ever played to completion, and the only one I've ever purchased. And that game is Shinsei Mokushiroku. So the first reason I bought this game is because it's an erotic visual novel crossed with an RPG, but not really that. Mostly because it's written by the scenario writer for the Shin Megami Tensei series. On top of that, it's part of the Shinsei Mokushiroku world, which is essentially the continued adventures of Shin Megami Tensei. 
The world itself is from a tabletop RPG converted from the SMT tabletop RPG after some kind of dispute. The game itself turned out to be quite good, but not for the reasons I was expecting. The RPG parts actually ended up being the weakest parts of the game, while the visual novel parts had me extremely hooked. The story was amazing and the characters were built up as stereotypes, only to have those expectations completely destroyed. Even the erotic parts are suitable to the game in the sense that they fit the tone of being disturbing and almost always something that you don't want to happen. Almost to the point where it's like the Edenverse of an erotic game. This has pretty much zero chance of ever being localized, but if you can read Japanese, I'd highly recommend it despite the middling RPG parts. Coming in at number 6, we have a game that combines two series that I enjoy a lot, Persona and Etrian Odyssey. That game is, of course, Persona Q. The game, while playing very much like Etrian Odyssey, manages to insert a story with characters from both Persona 3 and Persona 4, as well as a few new characters. The elements of Etrian Odyssey, such as map drawing, foes, and first-person dungeon crawling are all there, but a lot of character skits involving the casts of both Persona games are also present. The dungeons are all designed well, with nice attention to detail and varied themes that make it a very nice looking and stylish dungeon crawler which you would expect from a Persona game. It also manages to keep a bit of challenge from the Etrian Odyssey series. The only downsides I can think of is that some of the main elements I enjoy from both of the series, character creation and customization and social links from EO and Persona respectively, were nowhere to be found, which definitely knocked the game down a few places. That being said though, it's an interesting and fun dungeon crawler despite its generally low difficulty level and it managed to hook me enough to play through it two complete times, so it's absolutely worth a look for fans of either series. And here we are at the top five, and coming in at number five, we have Shadow of Mordor. Shadow of Mordor was a game I was really looking forward to when it was announced. Being a big Lord of the Rings fan, even if the game was going to be a cash-in movie license game, I was still planning on getting it for the environment and for another foray into the world of Tolkien. Fortunately, this game came out and blew away pretty much everyone's expectations for it. While it plays sort of like a mashup between the Arkham games and Assassin's Creed, it managed to take just the right elements from those games to feel quite good. On top of that, it takes a step further by adding the real game changer here, the Nemesis system. Pretty much everyone who talks about this game is crazy about the Nemesis system. It adds a lot of depth and replayability to what could have been just an above average game. The way that the system overlays a hierarchy of orcs that is dynamic and ever-changing regardless of if you do anything or not is really amazing. It can lead you to create your own plots and become a kingmaker amongst uruks only to kill that same uruk later or use him to attack others. This game I couldn't put down and played almost straight through in about three days. It was addictive and still offers a lot of fun even after the story is complete. 2014 was the year the PS4 was released in Japan. I got my PS4 at launch, and a lot of the reason for doing that was the game I have placed at number 4. Ryuga Gotoku Ishin, or Yakuza Restoration if you want to translate that to English. While nowhere near as popular as it should be outside of Japan, this series is easily one of the best series going today, and continuously gets better and better with each entry. While this game is a side story to the main series, it still manages to reach a certain level of greatness. Couple that with some really great choices by Sega, it made the experience a lot of fun to play. For those of you who have played a Yakuza game, this one follows a similar formula. You have a somewhat open city, various fighting styles to learn, and a multi-layered narrative full of all types of twists, turns, double crosses, and double double crosses. However, the backdrop of this game is actually a Yakuza-style retelling of actual historical events and historical characters. 
This made the story's layering even more interesting to the point where I was constantly researching historical happenings and characters throughout the game. The game drew me into not only the fictionalized narrative, but also into the actual history. Not to fear. There are plenty of crazy side stories involving joke characters like a Caucasian samurai named Tom, or a goofy product tie-in involving Meiji-era versions of modern shops like Don Quixote. Uh, there are mini-games, collection missions, simulations, and all types of interesting content and characters not related directly to the main story. You even get to punch the hell out of a bear. Uh, there is so much going on with this, and there are so many likable characters and game elements that it's always a pleasure to enter the world of Ryuga Gotoku, and this entry was no different. At number 3, we have one of the two games I took the time to get a platinum trophy for, Dark Souls 2. Dark Souls 2 was a game I was extraordinarily hyped for. Having played through the original Dark Souls about 40 times or so, I was expecting to be blown away by Dark Souls 2 and spend hundreds of hours with it. And while it didn't quite live up to that standard, it still managed to be a game I played through six times completely. Dark Souls 2 took the formula given to us in Demon Souls and Dark Souls and added its own flavor in order to come up with a different type of experience. The theme of Dark Souls 2 seemed to be more. Just more. More weapons, more characters, more armor, more bosses, more secrets. It definitely built and crafted its own world to make it stand out from previous games in the series. The online play was also changed for the better in my opinion, whereas I often felt that the online in the previous two games was slightly flawed, Dark Souls 2 managed to make it fun enough that there were plenty of times where I would forego playing the main story just to troll a bit harder with all acid weapons and spells in the bell tower. And while I don't think Dark Souls 2 manages to reach the same level in the single player as the previous titles, it still offered an amazing trip into a dark and enchanted world and it cemented itself quite early on in the year into the upper echelons of my top 10. Number 2 is a game I never expected to be here. It's a game that has almost no reason to be as amazingly good as it is. The game takes a strategy RPG formula, adds a lot of interesting elements, loads it full of licensed characters, and storms out to capture you from the first mission with addictive gameplay. Of course, I'm talking about Superhero Generation. Part of the Kampachi Hero series, this tactical RPG combines characters from Ultraman, Gundam, and Kamen Rider to fight against the various enemies and villains from those series as well as introducing new, game-specific characters. The battle system in the stage submissions are what make the game so amazing. Each stage expands and becomes more difficult as submissions are cleared, leading to higher bonuses, special rewards, and, of course, more characters. The system almost works in a way in which it rewards you for completing goals by swarming you with stronger enemies at inopportune times. This system made every stage feel unique and interesting. On top of the standard stages though, there are a series of increasingly difficult challenge stages where more items and experience can be unlocked, as well as offering chances to unlock more of the 35 total characters that are available. The challenge stages also have their own special story going on, which adds the replay value of them. I can honestly say, I played this game through the main story on all difficulty levels, and I played through every challenge stage on all difficulty levels as well. And after all of that was completed, I only wanted more of this game. The only other game I put the effort into getting the Platinum Trophy for in 2014 was this one. And it comes in at my number two spot and gets my highest recommendation. Go out and get it. Superhero Generation. And here we are, at number one. I think those of you who have been paying attention to my channel, and especially to what my favorite game is, probably won't be surprised by what I've chosen for number one in 2014. It's a sequel to a game that I remember fondly from my youth, in a style reminiscent of my favorite game ever. 
That game is Wasteland 2. Wasteland 2 managed to take me back to the peak period of my PC gaming past. It felt like playing a fleshed out version of the cancelled Van Buren, also known as the original Fallout 3. And while Wasteland 2 isn't a game that feels like a polished modern release, it manages to capture the magic of mid to late 90s PC RPG gaming in all of the right ways. Those of you who have played Fallout 1 and 2 will feel right at home with a lot of Wasteland 2. There is a map-based overworld peppered with instances to explore and battles to take part in. Exploring the world of Wasteland is fun because you never know what you might stumble upon, even though that exploration is done mostly via a cursor on a map. The quests you perform are all interesting and involve not only various solutions, but various results depending on your actions. For main quests, there are usually options in terms of which quest you can select and the results of your decisions are known relatively quickly. The beginning has a quest where you must choose between helping one of two settlements, and while you are performing the quests, you get constant radio updates with the other settlement, and you can hear one settlement being overrun while you go through and save the other. There are a lot of fun and interesting characters you meet along the way as well. They all have their own stories, and you can delve a little bit deeper into their characters while fighting alongside them. The game not only offers a lot of options for customization, it offers a lot of replayability through the story choices you make. The length of the game is nothing to scoff at either, with hundreds of hours of gameplay. Uh, if you want to play all the missions and find all the secret and hidden locations, expect a lot of playing. It's an amazing experience, and if you are a person like me who loves the original game, the original Fallout games, or just 90s style CRPGs, you should buy and play this game immediately. And that'll be the end of my top games of 2014. So how about you guys? What did you enjoy in 2014? Feel free to leave your top games below in the comments, or link videos if you got them. Whatever you want to do, just let me know. What did you guys like? This is my list. I'd like to hear yours. So yeah, that's about it. This video is done. I will see you guys next time.